Today on Investigate TV Plus. No one sees the war that you're battling. Patients' lives forever changed by a virus that some say doctors know little about. It's probably one of the biggest medical mysteries that I know of. We go in-depth to uncover the solutions for millions of Americans suffering from a lingering effect of the pandemic. Plus, teachers nationwide forced to give up time with their families in order to stay in classrooms. We compare salaries across the country and ask teachers what they're doing to keep up with the cost of living. Then, preserving the pioneer experience. See how a museum is giving visitors a new perspective on 19th century life in log cabins. In-depth stories that inform and inspire. You're watching Investigate TV+. Four years ago, the COVID-19 pandemic changed our world. I'm Tisha Powell. And I'm Lee Zurich. There were stay-at-home orders in closed schools, mask mandates, and social distancing. To date, the U.S. has seen more than 100 million cases, 6 million hospitalizations, and more than a million deaths as a result of the virus. And for some, the fight isn't finished. Data from the National Center for Health Statistics shows that as of October 2023, nearly 10% of adults who've had COVID are still dealing with symptoms. Their condition now known as long COVID. Reporter Heather Graff has a new perspective from patients and researchers amid an intensifying push for solutions. This is how Michael Sieverts always envisioned retirement. Traveling with family, hiking, skiing, and picking up new hobbies as well. I just become a yoga instructor, just complete a training course. But at 62, he says those plans are now on hold indefinitely in the aftermath of a global pandemic. You're just not part of society in the way you expected yourself to be. Michael is not referring to the strict COVID-19 shutdowns that most communities experienced in the spring of 2020. Instead, for him, it's the long-term effects of the virus itself. I first got COVID-19 in mid-March of 2020, and I got the test, came back positive a few days later, and that was, you know, confirmation. Then March became April. I got horrible chest pains and really, you know, brutal shortness of breath. April became May. I was thinking, I'm not getting better. And May became June. Some days I felt like I was getting worse. And at that point, you had never heard the term long COVID. I had not heard the term long COVID. And there were social media groups. Social media groups, people were documenting, writing about these experiences that were exactly like I was having. 38-year-old Cynthia Adenig was among them. There was thousands of people already. This is June. And while she, like Michael, got sick at the start of the pandemic, she was unable to get a COVID test at the time due to high demand. So Cynthia often felt dismissed by doctors and says it took months to find one that recognized her chronic symptoms as long COVID. Inability to eat or drink without having an allergic reaction, really high heart rate, really high blood pressure, dizziness, crippling, just the, just the worst fatigue. We now know the CDC broadly defines long COVID as signs, symptoms, and conditions that continue or develop after acute COVID-19 infection, noting those conditions can last weeks, months, or years. Dizziness, nausea, and fatigue 24-7. That's just constant. I have vertigo, and then I have dysautonomia. My body doesn't, doesn't regulate itself, my autonomic nervous system. So if I stand up, or sit up straight for too long, my blood pressure crashes and I start to, and I can faint. In fact, health experts have identified more than 200 symptoms associated with long COVID that can impact nearly every system in the body. And while estimates vary, it's believed as many as 23 million Americans may be suffering from it. My biggest frustration is just how limiting it is. Your life just has to be so constrained in order to just manage the day. Debilitating, he says, and yet four years later, there is still no FDA-approved treatment for long COVID and no real insight as to what's causing some people to get it. It's probably one of the biggest medical mysteries that I know of. 
Dr. Walter Koroshetz is co-lead of the National Institute of Health's Recover Initiative that began studying long COVID in 2021, equipped with more than a billion dollars in funding from Congress. Among the most recent developments, in July of 2023, the NIH announced its first clinical trials to test potential treatments for long COVID. You have to basically follow the clues, try different things. The question is what's going to stick? How long could that take, though? Well, I think you don't give up until you get there. Yet the NIH project and results thus far have faced criticism from some patients. They were underwhelming. Michael among those who feel the agency needs to pick up the pace. How do you respond to that criticism? I agree with them. <laughs> I really do. I really wish we were moving faster. If there was a quick fix to this problem, it probably would have been found by now. So to take a really deliberate you know, attack on the problem and build something that is this substantial, I think it gives us the best chance of eventually getting to the answers and getting to good treatments. And separate from those efforts are independent studies like this one out of Washington University in St. Louis that found people who've had even mild cases of COVID are at an elevated risk of developing long COVID conditions up to two years after their initial infection. It actually can still wreak havoc in your system. Dr. Ziad Al-Ali authored that report and is considered a leading long COVID researcher. So we asked him the question that people living with this condition are desperate to answer. What is the solution then? Three things. Scale to match the problem, urgency because people really need treatment yesterday, and coordination because no matter how hard we work, if you don't have a captain of your team or if you don't have a quarterback, your chances of winning that, that game, probably not very good. And during a January Senate hearing on long COVID, he told members of Congress exactly the same. This is going to require a coordinated approach. Cynthia, for her part, has also testified on Capitol Hill. This is their thank you for me. And just below, the framed photos and letters from lawmakers in her home. Four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's eight right now. She showed us the many medications that are her and her doctor's best attempt at managing this illness. You grieve your health a lot. As for Michael. This is how I work. He advocates for change mostly from home. This dark room set up strategically to accommodate his dysautonomia and sensitivity to light. I go out very, very rarely. If I go out, I'll be in bed for the next day or so. Pacing himself and yet still hopeful for a long COVID breakthrough and the retirement he always dreamed of. Do you think we'll get there? Oh yeah, I do actually. I know it won't happen quickly, but I think there will be tremendous progress over the next few years. In February, the NIH announced it would invest an additional $515 million into its recover initiative that's dedicated to long COVID research. And then last year, Democratic Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia and Republican Senator Todd Young of Indiana introduced legislation called the Long COVID Support Act. The two lawmakers have also spoken openly about their own experiences living with this condition. I've been dealing with my own long COVID issue for almost four years. It's mild, thank goodness. Um, I feel like every nerve ending in my body is in an Alka-Seltzer 24-7. And it is, I can work, I can focus, I can exercise. It's harder to sleep. That was Senator Kane at a recent Senate hearing focused on long COVID. And we can tell you their bipartisan legislation aims to accelerate research and expand resources for both patients and medical providers. In Washington, I'm Heather Brown. There is some help if you or a loved one is out of work due to long COVID. The Department of Labor says that you can contact the Job Accommodation Network for free guidance and resources at askjan.org. Still to come, constant seizures turned a mom's life upside down. It was horrible for everyone because it affected everyone's life. It wasn't just my life. But a groundbreaking procedure is giving her new hope. What do you do for someone who saved your life, you know? Plus, teachers have passion, but that doesn't always pay the bills. I know how it feels to have your lights cut off. I know how it feels to have your water cut off. We talk to educators who work multiple jobs so they can continue the career they love. The minute I enter my school, I forget everything because I give it all.
teachers, they touch the lives of millions every day and help shape the future of our country. But despite progress to raise their pay, there are concerns it's not enough. The National Education Association says when adjusted for inflation, teachers are making $3,600 less on average than they did 10 years ago. It's led some to get multiple jobs or side hustles. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, during the 2020-21 school year, about 17% of K-12 teachers had jobs outside their school system even though they spent an average of 52 hours per week on all school-related activities. Reporter Sharon Chen shows us the lengths some teachers go to to stay in the classroom. Another Uber Eats run. I need to confirm. This is what Paula Ramirez does in her spare time. This is the best kit to get. She also sells essential oils. A dot behind your ears. Tutors and teaches dance. But her full-time job is teaching. I've always wanted to be a teacher. Unfortunately, it's a career that isn't exactly paying off. Uh, yes, I am struggling. I am struggling. A struggling teacher of Spanish and math for Kansas City Public Schools. We're not getting paid less as we should. And on top of all that, she's a mom, a single mother of two. It's like a vicious cycle. Yes, I can do Zumba, I can teach salsa, I can tutor to other students, but that's time away from my two girls. I know how it feels to have your lights cut off. I know how it feels to have your water cut off. Sandra Days is with the Kansas City chapter of the Teachers Union, the American Federation of Teachers, she knows all about oh, yeah. teacher pay. I hear the struggle all the time, and I know of the struggle. Day says from a new teacher to one of even five years of experience making an average of $50,000 a year, paychecks in KC just don't go far. Your first check goes to your rent. Your second check goes to your student loans and your utilities. Missouri education leaders admit teacher pay is a problem. I'm Paul Katnick. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Educator Quality. When it comes to teachers in the classroom, there's a serious shortage in Missouri. It basically comes down to several things. One of them is pay. Pay, which according to state law, is required to be at a minimum of just $25,000 a year. So starting pay in the state of Missouri, we, we have the distinction of being pretty much at the bottom. As in second to last. 50th when compared to other states, including the District of Columbia. The average first-year teacher salary in Missouri, just over $34,000 a year. In fact, all eight states surrounding Missouri are higher. And so attracting teachers to the state of Missouri is a real challenge when you can't pay them like other states can. Katnick says there is legislation to permanently boost pay with the goal of raising base pay to $60,000 but it is work in progress. There's going to have to be, I think, successive years of continuing to work at it um, and trying to make it to where our teachers can do one thing, and that's teach. All right. Until then, Paula has to put in extra hours at extra jobs. I call myself, I'm the working poor. Galleta. Literally working to teach. Galleta. A daily struggle, but all forgotten just to do what she loves. But I will tell you this, the minute I enter my school, I forget everything because I give it all. Now, an in-depth look at teacher pay across the country. During the 2021-2022 school year, the average annual salary for K-12 teachers was just over $66,000. New York, Massachusetts, and California paid the highest at an average of more than $85,000, while teachers in West Virginia, South Dakota, and Mississippi earned an average of $50,000 or less. Still ahead, epilepsy robbed a mother of her ability to care for her family. I couldn't stop seizing, so I couldn't make it better for them. We examine the life-changing surgery to stop her seizures.
The CDC says epilepsy is one of the most common neurological conditions affecting 3.4 million Americans. That's about the same number of people living in South Dakota, Vermont, and West Virginia combined. The Epilepsy Foundation explains people with the condition have seizures, which are like unexpected electrical storms in the brain, and it can impact day-to-day -day life, making it hard to work or take care of a family. The Mayo Clinic says two-thirds of patients are effectively treated with medication. But for those who have drug-resistant epilepsy, surgery might be an option. Reporter Michaela Castillo spoke with one Phoenix mom who says the procedure gave her back control of her life. I had no life, literally no life. Nicole Phillips, a young mom of three, had her world turned upside down. It was horrible for everyone because it affected everyone's life. It wasn't just my life. Nicole was diagnosed with epilepsy at just 14 years old, but it wasn't until several years later her condition got worse. It wasn't until 2018 when I was nine months pregnant with my daughter I had one and that was after that it was pretty out of control. Nicole was on nearly 4,000 milligrams of medicine and suffered from seizures non-stop. I was probably having like two to three a day multiple a week. And being a mom to her kids almost became impossible. I couldn't stop seizing, so I couldn't make it better for them. I wasn't able to be there for them. It's not fun to see your significant other spouse on the couch, can't move to get up to bed. You have to help them up to go to the bathroom. You have to help them do that. You kind of, it's hard to see. It wasn't until Nicole and her husband found Mayo Clinic that their lives changed forever. Nicole had a very severe type of epilepsy and our high resolution imaging of the brain here at Mayo Clinic was able to pinpoint the exact location where that abnormality was in the brain and that allowed us as a team to develop a strategy to generate a very tailored surgery to actually remove that abnormality in the brain. After nearly four hours of surgery and several weeks of physical therapy, Nicole finally got her life back. I haven't had any seizures. Um, I do everything with my kids. They're all three busy kids in multiple sports. Um, I own my own company now. It's a gift Nicole and her family will forever be grateful for. What do you do for someone who saved your life? You know, like it's, it, there's no, nothing. I, I just, I thank you so much. They're so amazing. I just, my, everything goes out to them. Phillips had the procedure in November of 2022, and she says she has been seizure free since. Up next, watch history come to life as we travel to the country's largest collection of log cabins. Thanks to an abundance of timber and its relatively easy construction, log cabins became a symbol of the American frontier. About an hour northwest of Charlotte, North Carolina, you can see history come alive. Reporter John Carter takes us to the museum that's preserving 19th century traditions to inspire the next generation. To visit Hart Square Village is like stepping back in time. This is the largest log cabin museum in the United States. 103 log cabin structures on a 250 acre reserve. What types of different structures are out here? We have a blacksmith shop, a grist mill, we have a jail, a tavern, a print shop, a millinery, a schoolhouse, a post office, a doctor's office, so many different varieties of shops. These are all authentic structures from the 17 and 1800s initially found within a 30 mile radius of Vail. It all began back in 1973 when landowner Dr. Robert Hart III acquired the first cabin. He had a friend who had a cabin on his property and the friend said it would look great next to your lake. That's the Hunsucker cabin. Um, so they took it apart at that location, numbered all the logs and then recreated it here. Built it log by log back here. Um, and that's what started off a passion for collecting. As word of the first cabin spread, 
Others donated cabins that were on their property. Dr. Hall even used his private airplane to fly over the area looking for log structures. Once reassembled, each structure is fully furnished as it would have been back in its original time. This is basically how it would have looked this back was, in the 1800s. This is how it would have looked. This is one of my favorite pieces in it. It's a bathtub and you only had one thing of water. So if you bathed it, oldest to youngest. So the youngest had the worst water. Dr. Hart passed away several years ago, but his vision continues. Now operated by the Hart Foundation, the mission here is to ensure the preservation of historic structures as well as traditional crafts and trades. It's important to not only learn, but also see how other people lived. Dr. Hart was very big on the pioneer spirit, so being hardy and um, working hard and Walking through those cabins shows you what people had to go through every day um, and how hard they work just yeah. to sustain their living. You need to buy a membership to visit Hart Square, but numerous events are held here year round that the public is invited to attend. When somebody comes here, Nicole, and they come to visit and to see all this, what do you all want them to take away after they leave? The profound, just an awe of history really is what I get every time I walk into a cabin and how hard life was but how fulfilling most of the people who lived in those houses found it and just that gratefulness for where we are now and how much we've grown as a nation and with our history. All right, I'm the youngest child. I don't understand why they bathe oldest to youngest, so the youngest gets the dirty bathtub. And the youngest is probably the cleanest. The cleanest and smallest, right? <laughs> yeah. Stayed in the house all day. Should have gone reverse order back yeah. then. Oh well. All right, that's it for us on Investigate TV Plus. I'm Lee Zurich. And I'm T. Chappelle. Thanks for watching. Next time on Investigate TV Plus, as their son served his country, he also struggled with his mental health. Now this couple's mission is keeping this sailor's memory alive. We knew from his final words to us that he wanted us to do something. How their work on Capitol Hill could help save the lives of service members present and future.